my dad. Oops. Ah. All right, I think I'll pop up another spike from there. No, it's all right. Um, in that case, let's get underway. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, you join us tonight for the first of what we hope will become a series of events, uh, inquiring into the challenges and strategies we face organizing for change in the academy over the long term. This first event will focus on the discussion of the Millbank era and the current red strikes. Uh, what we're calling the Millbank era is the loose time period around 2010 and 2011, in which an enormous number of students in the UK mobilized in protest, primarily around rises in university fees, which were a violation of electoral campaign promises. One of the defining moments in this era was the spontaneous storming of the Conservative Party headquarters, Millbank, in London, hence the name. We've invited some guests to help lead the conversation tonight. Allow me to introduce, first, Dr. Hamish Callan, a lecturer in human geography here at the University of Edinburgh, and a critical thinker on issues around student housing, and a participant in the Millbank era. We also have Dr. Alexander Hensby, lecturer in sociology in the University of Kent, who studies theories of participation and non-participation in social movements. And lastly, we also have Matthew from the Red Strike Movement, who's a postgraduate student studying, studying sociology at the London School of Economics. Without further ado, I am going to pass on to Alex to introduce us to his research. And after that, we're just going to go straight into discussion. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, so I'll say a little bit about, um, I suppose, talk a bit to the idea of participation and non-participation, because I think this is sort of a big part of, of why we uh, are here and, and frame that particularly around the process of 2010-2011. So I was doing my, my PhD in 2010 and I was doing it at the University of Edinburgh and I ended up doing my PhD on the student process and I was looking particularly at participation and non-participation, trying to, as, as the protests were happening at the time, I was able to um, study those two phenomenon kind of side by side. And so I did, I conducted a survey and then I did um, interviews with um, occupation groups and also non-participants um, up and down the country. So from the survey, which was about two and a half thousand students, I found that, um, 22% of students participated in the protests, that is doing anything, whether it's occupying Millbank or signing a petition. And that seems sort of quite low, um, though actually it's sort of quite sort of commensurate to the process of the 1960s when you think about the, the percentage of those who were really sort of active and those who were um, leading those protests. And what was interesting was that among the non-participants, um, two thirds said in the survey that they were supportive of the protests. So you had this enormous constituency. That, so that's more than half of all students, if we, if we take the view that my survey was representative. More than half of students did not participate in anything, um, but they were supportive of the protests. So what my research was doing was looking at some of the reasons as to why some people became active and one, why some people did not become active. And I think, um, you know, obviously sort of go into this um, later on, but I think what's obviously political socialization is really important, but the campus, the university of campus has the potential to politicize people. And we of course all know that and have experienced that ourselves. Um, but I think you can still feel sort of disconnected um, to opportunities to participate um, based on who's in your immediate social circle. So, you can have on Facebook, you can have on social media, all the kind of protest information at your disposal, but having somebody to go to the protest with, having someone to reinforce that um, through having conversations, making it part of your sort of your thought process is really important for sort of translating that into your own thought and action. And one of my student interview interviewees said that going on a uh, going on a demonstration on your own is like going to a party when you don't know anyone. It's not something that's impossible to do, but if you don't have the confidence, you don't have the prior experience and you don't have the, you don't expect to meet anybody that you already know, that's quite a hard thing to do. So having a social circle around you is really important. At the same time, being able to counter the sort of, um, the counter networks, the people who are sort of 
disregarding and, and disapproving of protest and activism, either the cause or the actual act. And there's all, often a sort of focus on the most sort of nefarious or controversial things. In the case of Millbank, it was um, the fire extinguisher can that was uh, tossed from the, from the roof. And it can be used against a movement as a sort of, um, as a way of a blanket uh, judgment of, of everything that's going on. So you have to counter, if you're not a confident and experienced activist, your desire to do something, your desire to sort of represent that movement, have that represent, that movement represent you is then easily countered by those counter networks and those counter discourses. And they also um, draw quite strongly on disidentification, sort of negative characterizations of student activism, um, which I'm sure everybody um, has sort of faced one time or another. But it's the kind of conflict of these networks, and you have to kind of find pathways that enable and encourage. Um, somebody who may want to convert their interest into action, but it needs to be legitimized. It needs to be sort of domesticated and, and be seen as a kind of social as well as political activity. So creating those networks that facilitate participation is really important. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex, for that introduction. So getting in to the main part of our discussion. I wish I had a smooth way to jump straight off from that, but I just have to ask everyone to try and use this as a bit of food for thought. Um, and we're going to jump back to the Millbank era now um, and ask any of our participants, um, feel free to either put a little star in the chat, put your hand up physically, um, or just unmute yourself and start talking if you're really confident, um, to, uh, to think about and answer, speak to the question, uh, what do you think are some of the most powerful or persistent groups that emerged from the Millbank era of protest. And if you want to evaluate that at all, feel free. Does anyone feel I have anything to speak to on that? Bantu's willing to jump in, go for it. Yeah, sorry, I know I'm not one of the, the, the formal speakers, but just as something to say, which is, you see a lot of the kind of contemporary commentary at Novara types and that lot, not to critique them necessarily, but they're very conscious that they are from that era. A lot of the kind of like institutionalized far left, whatever you want to call it now, perceive themselves to come, kind of, you know, come of age in that, in that kind of political landscape. So it's interesting how there is a political legacy of that period, maybe not within the university, but of a kind of strata of the political, the journalistic world or the organizing world. And it like has existed and continues to exist in a particular way outside of universities. So I think the culture of Millbank, most students aren't aware of it at all, really. Well, you know, some are, and maybe exist institutionally in some movements and stuff, but, you know, the militancy and radicalism that was found in campuses is now totally departed from campuses from 10 years ago. It now exists in this other political strata. And it's interesting, there doesn't seem to be like a strong association with those people in the student movement at all. They've kind of like, you know, they like cut their teeth in the movement 10 years ago and now they're being leftists elsewhere and this kind of like original and the original kind of formation ground for that leftism is kind of like left behind. I don't know if there's anything interesting to say about that, but it's something Milbank's kind of referred to as that kind of like foundational thing for a lot of contemporary leftists or like big, big kind of media people. But, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting on that front as well. Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, so when when I saw this question, I sort of immediately thought of two things. Um, and I guess one of them is more powerful and one of them is more persistent. Um, and so the, fir the first sort of movement I thought of was the Cops Off Campus movement um, back in 2013. I think that was quite a powerful movement in a sense that it sort of exploded quite quickly. Um, it was quite, you know, obviously very militant politics. Um, and involves sort of a huge number of people um, a few years after sort of Millibank had happened um, when maybe there was not so much going on, but sort of as quickly as it appeared, it sort of disappeared, um, which maybe is, is um, a sign of sort of the lack of formal organisation around it. Um, but sort of the second movement that I think um, sort of emerged from the Millibank era that I think is really important is uh, the base unions. Uh, around the Free Cosas campaign at the University of London. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, um, there was essentially a split uh, from Unison at the University of London um, in the cleaners and security 
another auxiliary workers branch, um, which formed uh, the Independent Workers of Great Britain, the IWGB, who now have thousands of members who are involved in um, quite exciting uh, militant trade unionism and that have had splits occur from them to form other sort of uh, so-called base unions. Um, and I think these are really persistent groups and really powerful groups in the sense that they've um, sort of not only managed to maintain and grow since this period, since sort of the Miller-Bank era, but they've also not lost the politics upon which they were founded, which maybe you couldn't say the same for people such as Novara or people who sort of entered the Labour Party and stuff like this. So I think that's sort of the one that comes ahead, and particularly within the student movement um, in London, when I look at sort of intergenerational um, transfers of knowledge um, and sort of widespread use of tactics, um, that of like student worker organizing uh, and particularly starting from um, sort of the lowest paid workers in university and doing so um, is something that really has caught on in here over the past five years. Um, and I think that is because of um, these campaigns and these base unions uh, and their presence and continued presence. Image, go ahead. Um, hello. Uh, yeah, I totally agree very much with, with what's been said so far. Um, just a couple of reflect reflections. Um, I mean, this is really obvious, right? But the problem with this, with the continuation of a student movement is that when you finish your degree, you're no longer a student. So tracing the lineage of kind of politicization cannot be done by looking at necessarily students. Um, and so Dante's right, you've got the kind of Navarra legacy, but I guess they're, they're the ones that you know of because they've, they're famous in a sense. But I, but I guess one of the things that I, I'm very aware of looking back is how many people who uh, you know, slept in Appleton Tower, for example, are now doing things, whether they're working for unions or they're working for housing campaigns or they're academics who study kind of protest movements or uh, they, they are in, the, in themselves still politicized. Now, maybe they, maybe they were before, but I guess there's an, there's an individual legacy, which is obviously less kind of politically glamorous because it isn't a movement, but the way that the experience of these moments stays with you, even if you are no longer uh, with the experience, if you know what I mean. The second is that, I, and um, I've made this point before, but I think if you, if some of those legacies are more enduring. So, for example, in Edinburgh, um, the Edinburgh Student Housing Cooperative was basically founded by people that met and were galvanized by that uh, protest movement. Um, I, I I think living rent would what you could also trace to a similar lineage in terms of the people that founded it um, were also part of that generation, if you want to use that term. And they're two like really exciting, enduring, hopefully permanent kind of fixtures in the political landscape of, of the city and, and the nation. Um, that that sort of aren't they're not obviously part of the student movement, but but they but they're, they're interesting legacies nonetheless. So yeah, I'll, that, I'll stop there for now, but hopefully that made some sense. Okay, thank you very much, Hamish. Uh, if anyone else wants to jump in on that question, uh, feel free to stick your hand up. Uh, but otherwise, I was actually going to ask them, all these uh, various groups uh, that we mentioned, and I'll just quickly run through what I managed to note down there, out of Navarra, Cops on Campus, IWGB and the various base unions, uh, politicised individuals, the Edinburgh Student Housing Co-op and Living Rent. Um, to anyone who's currently involved in student activism or the rent strikes, um, were any of these groups involved in or in any way in contact during the establishment of these rent strikes? This is primarily going to you, Matthew, but um, anyone else? Feel free to put your hand up too. Um, I think, I think there's sort of maybe two, I'll ask this sort of in two ways. So I think in terms of these current waves of rent strikes that are occurring, um, I think there's actually a distinctive sort of 
lack of contact with these sort of groups. Um, that sort of contact has happened afterwards with stuff like tenants unions and and um, various sort of extra parliamentary groups. Um, there hasn't really been any contact between the base unions and stuff like that. Um, but in terms with sort of the foundation of rent strike, uh, if you go back to sort of 2015, 2016, um, there was a big um, sort of collaboration with um, people who come out of um, the Miliband era and organizations that came out of the Miliband era. So um, I know a number of individuals um, who I won't name because I think, um, I don't know if people know them, but um, <laughs> uh, who, who had graduated from university but were involved um, in, in the formation of the rent strikes at, at UCL back in 2015, um, who were sort of very networked individuals and with them brought in um, other organizations that were of that era. So one that particularly stands out is Plan C, um, was particularly involved in um, sort of the rent strikes back then, um, not so much now. Um, and individuals who would, who were at that point in time, were not part of, were politicized by the Miliband era, but not part of any sort of formal organizations as such yet, would then go on after being involved in Rent Strike um, to be involved, to like found unions like uh, Acorn Brighton or London Renters Union. Um, so I think those are quite interesting connections there. Um, if that answers the question. It does indeed. Uh, does anyone else want to speak to any of that? Anything that anyone is interested in and wants to pick up on the question? Okay. Go ahead. Maybe this is more of a, a question which we could discuss later on, which is just from what Matthew is saying, and there's such a clearly distinct regionalism to this, which is Scotland, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you can talk about Plan C in this way as well, that if you're in Scotland and Edinburgh, these network, these kind of like mass networks of political people are infinitely smaller and infinitely weaker. And they're not, we don't like, of course, there's a really rich militant history in Scotland and stuff. But if you, especially in the student student movement, which I think we should totally abandon that as a designator, like you could, these kind of networks don't exist or these histories are much harder to draw on. Maybe this is just my total ignorance of four years of being here and not like trying to learn about these histories and make up links with these people. But there's a clear kind of regionalism, which it very much depends on which university city you're in, the very particular university legacy you're working within. So one of the questions is thinking, well, if you want to create like a really broad UK wide student movement, how do you kind of escape the, the kind of like small isolated pockets of like strong militant histories to develop struggle in other places, which, you know, most people can't draw on these things because they're not in those locations. So maybe that'd be something we could discuss later on. Sophia. Yeah, I just want to say something to continue from <clears throat> what Dante said about the kind of the regionalism. Um, of course, I'm not I'm not a student and I wasn't part of the student movement here because I'm from a different generation. I was in a different country. Um, but I have I have thought about the sort of connections between the regions and the kind of different things that we kind of try uh, every time. Um, and I think there is something about the, the mentality of the localized action that keeps people sort of like contained, that, that they feel that, that in order to be productive, you've got to focus in your region and, and do your sit and then stuff would happen you don't you don't have time to kind of do other things um, and I have heard these in so many discussions when you're trying to say to people let's do this let's do this connection they, they don't find necessary to invest time in um, exchanges with other something outside your region um, or another country for example like sort of like have, have an exchange with trade unions or we kind of movements from from other countries um, and that has created those things so for example specifically this um, idea of plan C in Scotland um, there have been other groups in um, the ISG who was at an earlier time in Scotland and which led 
uh, to the, um, the radical independence movement and uh, the, 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 the political group rise afterwards, which was like very similar people and people who were doing them better than zero as well alongside the living rent, which are all very parallel to the London renters and the plan sit down in England. Like, like, like it is as if they are one group, all of these people. Uh, and yet the, they wouldn't engage, like they just wouldn't, uh, they were not in, interested in, uh, in, in each other. So I think this uh, pandemic will help us <laughs> because we have become used to, to be talking to each other in this online way. Uh, and, and I think the movement will benefit from that if we can manage to get out of the, you know, if this vaccine work and everything, and <laughs> we'll go back out in the streets. Uh, we have become used to a different way of communicating, uh, which I think might kind of move some of these barriers and some of these habits uh, and kind of make people understand the necessity of kind of exchange and, and sharing how much these people are in another geographical location is not like an other place. It's just the same place in capitalism. Uh, it's no different, so. Thank you very much, Sophia. So uh, I saw two hands up there and uh, in the order I saw them, uh, apologies to Connie, but I saw Silver first and then we'll go to Connie afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah, so I was just, thinking in terms of I mean I know nothing about the Milbank era I've never heard of this before but in terms of thinking about the ways in which connections between different places I was thinking about that like at the end of the last set of occupations just before lockdown there were people trying to connect those occupations and they were a bit chaotic and they weren't particularly radical and so I think it's interesting about like who puts that vested interest who puts in that time to make those connections and it's seemingly not more radical groups maybe slightly less radical groups there was some talk about it there being some kind of entryism and I'm not sure how true that is um but I suppose there's something about, see, I, like, I don't know why, why did they have that interest in building bigger networks? Is it because they're more centralist, whereas other people want more decentralization and with more decentralization, there's less of a need to build the networks? I don't know, but I just think that's interesting. Thank you very much, Silver. Yeah, very good contribution. Uh, Connie. Uh, yeah, I would agree with Silver too. I wanted to to speak back to Dante's point. I like, it's interesting how, you know, people might think that uh, if there is a rich tradition of sort of student ra radicalism or student activism in a certain place, that that sort of gives you a head start. Because like, obviously, I'm just not speaking from my experience, but I feel like that's not always the case. I feel like sometimes a rich tradition can be really intimidating. And uh, part of the reason why I found it so easy to get involved in activism in Edinburgh is because the Marxist society was tiny. There were like a few people there. They didn't seem particularly scary. Whereas I feel like um, some places in London where activism was kind of seen as this cool thing that everyone does with a very rich tradition, that's very intimidating maybe to people who are not so outgoing and that might create a more in interested sort of social di dynamic in, in the groups that then form in those places that don't have that kind of rich tradition. Thank you very much, Connie. Uh, Matthew. Yeah, I think I think just building on what Connie has just said, um, something that I found quite um, interesting about, about organizing in London is that you do have these very, very networked individuals and you have this rich history and people generally come to university here and they stay. Um, so you have this sort of wealth of, of activists and organizers. Um, but because of that, there are sort of, I think quite interesting dynamics in terms of people feeling they've ascended the student movement as a, a sort of whatever that term actually constitutes um, and therefore won't spend energy or time sort of transferring this knowledge or transferring these skills um, to, to younger generations. Um, but also um, comparing sort of 
the like just general the general left movement in in London to Manchester, where I'm originally from, is that uh, although we have, you know, I think a larger base of of organisers and activists, um, uh, there it's incredibly incredibly sectarian, um, even within sort of tendencies that you might, you know, you wouldn't expect um, people to be to be arguing within or refusing to work together within. Um, there's a lot a lot of non cooperation. Um, which maybe means that actually, even though we have a large number of, of organizers and activists or whatever, um, there may still be less people sort of working together than there may be in a place like Edinburgh um, or whatever. And I think this really shone through when I compared sort of London to, to Manchester and when I go back and I like do um, bits of organizing with friends there, um, people, there, there, there isn't that level of, of, of divide um, and, and in a sense, in that way, the movement in Manchester has always felt bigger to me than it has in London, despite um, obviously being actually smaller in in number of bodies. Um, so I thought that was just something interesting to bring in. That's very interesting. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I see two hands just going up, but Alex, did you have your hand up before during that point? Uh, so we'll go Alex, then Maddie, and then Poppy. <clears throat> Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that and, and, and tie it to the sort of Millbank generation, because I think one of the things that's very, one of the things that makes it quite easy to romanticise that particular protest campaign at that time was that with the tuition fees, um, the vote, uh, it was announced, and I think it's about seven weeks from the announcement that fees were going to be trebled, and there was the vote in Parliament. There were seven weeks to kind of mount some sort of campaign and seven weeks is enough time to actually make quite quite a splash quite a difference and it also focused people's attention of course in 2010 there were all the same gripes and uh, sectarian problems you know differences and what was remarkable is that having that shared grievance of <clears throat> the tuition trying to stop that bill from going through, trying to put enough pressure on the Lib Dems in particular to um, vote down that bill. It meant that you had people who, you had a coalition of people who believed in, who believed that tuition fees at 3,000 pounds was totally reasonable. And then you, they were sharing the same space with people who believed that universities should be abolished. <laughs> or the concept of kind of, you know, had a much more radical view of, of what public education should be but at that moment it harnessed a coalition that they were all pointing in the same direction you had this common grievance and it meant that through occupations you had this sort of sense of democracy you had this sense of being a, a multi-participatory movement where everybody was sort of what whatever they were doing was was part of something which was about applying pressure and part of the problem with the, the dissipation of Millbank was that you had this enormous agency, this enormous sort of moment of empowerment, and nearly, nearly got, uh, nearly forced Parliament to, uh, to sort of vote that bill down. That it was then really hard to pick yourself back up, and what actually hadn't existed at that time were, was genuine sort of convergence because you had a shared grievance at that time that you could sort of put aside your sectarian or your political differences because you had this this sort of this grievance that everybody kind of shared even if it was coming from different directions and that's a that's a constant tension with with you know leftist movements and student movements as well as how do you build this sort of broader coalition and be able to find a be able to articulate and express a grievance that speaks to everybody, I think, um, and to sort of express it in different ways, I think, for different people is, is quite, the, quite the challenge. Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, next up on the stack is Maddie. Yeah, I think it's interesting what was said about like the size of student movements. I think particularly what Connie said about like getting into an activist group because it's kind of seen as smaller and more approachable. I think like just from like my own experience sometimes the kind of smaller groups tend to have more of a tradition of those who have graduated will still come back and like I know I can still call people who have probably graduated two three years ago but have kind of been involved in like similar kind of protests and kind of how that links to the size of the movement and how you can kind of like 
how it's possible to maintain those kind of connections when the movement gets bigger and kind of like the challenges of that, I think is quite interesting. Thank you very much. And next up is Poppy. Yeah, so I just want to um, draw on a few points that have already been made. So we were uh, touching on sort of the geography of student protests earlier. And I think what was distinct and unique and really special, something that stood out about the so-called Millbank era, so the 2010 student protests, and uh, there were some before and some after that. I think the, the ones after were um, bigger than the ones that were before 2010, but 2010 was the, the biggest. What, was re what really stood out about that protest movement was that it was able to transcend geographical barriers. So I was an undergraduate at those protests. And the thing that really stood out to me was that students from across the whole UK were on buses going to that protest. And they were all united around this, you know, this one message. And I think that the tuition fee proposition, the policy proposition, was um, definitely sort of an accelerator of, um, of that protest movement. But I think it was wider than that. I think, you know, these were the sort of kids of the crash. Um, they sort of foresaw what the Tory administration and policy agenda was going to be like when they were going to be sort of growing up as, as adults. And there was a lot of fear around that and people sort of used the vocabulary of protest to refer back to, to refer to that movement but from from my own lived experience of 2009 10 11 being in those demonstrations i would describe them more as riots they were riots against the, that were largely concentrated in the financial district they were riots against the the financial uh, establishment and economic inequalities. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it needs to, our sort of view of, of that era needs to be broadened out a little bit. Um, I think, yeah, I would argue that it, it was a sort of mixture of, of riots and protests and what was distinct about it was the, the singular strong robust message and its ability to transcend um, sort of the provincial and, and geographical borders and barriers that are often present in student UK student politics. Um, but I also think it's really important that we don't romanticize it because yes, we saw these um, really significant shifts in, um, in sort of uh, political activism on campuses and a shift to the left and um, the, ex the student executive teams, so sabbatical teams were sometimes entirely made up of the SWP. That was something that we'd sort of, we haven't seen for decades, um, sort of that sort of left demographics in um, sabbatical teams. Yes, the left movement was massive on campuses around 2010, but so was the opposition. The young conservatives were absolutely massive. Um, so I think it's really important that we don't see it as this sort of golden era of left student politics, because yes, the, the student left were powerful, but that had a that was met with a sort of equally powerful conservative student movement. It was a very polarized time. Thank you very much, Poppy. Uh, that was a lot to go through. So um, if anyone wants to reply to any of those after Silver. Yeah, uh, sorry. Please. No, no, no problem. No, uh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. I just wanted to say before I pass on to Silver, um, if you do want to join in um, the conversation, uh, feel free to put a little asterisk, a star in the chat, um, or as I've just done there, uh, or you can use the raise hand function or physically raise your hand, and I'll try to keep an eye on something that. So we'll go to Silver and then after Silver, there'll be Daddy. I was just thinking because we've been talking about like more national um, student movements that actually I was well at the very peripheries. Um, I went to um, two or three years ago at this point, there was the school strike for climate and it's not student activism in the way we think about it because it's not university students, but I'd argue it is a form of student activism. 
Um, but it felt like certainly very disconnected from all of this. Like it was a different group of people. Um, a lot of them very, very young. Like I remember like going and there being a lot of 11 year olds, um, like strikingly young. And I think it's interesting um, cause I, I know people who were involved in stuff in 2010, who were also like in sick form. So probably like a similar age to how old I was, I went to those strikes for the climate, but they, they it's not connected. It was never connected at all. It didn't, we didn't really identify it as student protest. So almost there's like a time gap there which I guess is also present in a lot of the other activism we do, where it's only the people who are at the university, at the school at that time. And then there's that lack of information sharing between different age groups. Thank you very much, Silver. And uh, next up we have Dante, then afterwards it'll be Matthew and then Hamish. Yeah, I'll try to be quick because I know I've been speaking quite a lot. Um, just to kind of draw on quite a few of the last things people have been saying, particularly what Poppy was reflecting on, not to be too like grandiose, but I guess it draws us to the, kind of the question of organization, like not to be too, you know, draw into like a broader set of political debates, which is precisely it's well, we've had to you know certain waves and cycles of student struggle. And then there's been, you know, the last four years of UCU oriented worker struggle, but at no point does it seem in a, particularly meaningful way of these things radically converged and become the same political project in the sense that there has been a profound political gap between students and workers in universities. And I mean, it seems that the key question as well, what is the organization? It's not just, you, you know, we've discussed well, the fact that sometimes it's about having smaller networks that people makes it easier for activists to come into, but it's also about the organizational form that these struggles take place in, which is why, you know, the staff student solidarity network, I think is an interesting thing that we should also be discussing because I think in some sense, we're trying to answer some of these questions about the transmission of knowledge and the way in which we can overcome the kind of like student organizing and the kind of all the cliches that come with student organizing or the way in which workers are siloed into the kind of particular terrain of unions and stuff. So I don't know where I'm going with it, but it's kind of like, well, say with when Poppy's talking about the Millbank stuff and the kind of politics of the campuses at the time, which was there was a really there's a really strong left, but there's also a really strong right. But it's like, well, what kind of like organizational forms were these taking on? Was it just a thoroughly like there was lots of politics on campus? Because clearly at the moment there is very, very little politics on campus. We live in a very depoliticized campus. Obviously, you have the environmental movement and the kind of really impressive militancy of like kind of anti-racist struggle, but in reality, we live in a thoroughly, thoroughly depoliticized campus. So it's not just a question of thinking about, well, getting more people involved, it's in what sense do people need to be involved to return to a thoroughly political campus? How do we actually bring workers and students and all these parallel struggles together and kind of have, you need like an organizational form that can articulate the fact that it's, it's a political struggle which we should be united in and it's not these kind of independent strands of struggle. So that was quite waffly, but that was just the thought was coming off the top of my head there. No, that's good. Thank you very much, Dante. Uh, next up, we'll have Matthew, and after that, it'll be Hamish. Yeah, I'll, I'll also try and be quick. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to, to, to address two things. And the first, um, in terms of this question of um, national and, and regional um, divides, uh, I think for me, in my experience, there, there was a real sort of turning point between when I felt connected and and, and networked within sort of the wider student movement uh, and not just the student movement in London um, and that was um, in 2018 where I went to the last ever and Kafka conference which was um, an interesting event to say the least um, sort of like slowly seeing a cow shoot itself in the foot um, it but but for for you know i think criticisms people had of, of organizations like nkafka um it was an sort of network and creative forums where um i got to meet people from other campuses um where struggles could link up um if we hadn't had that conference the rent strike movement uh, might have died all the way back in 2018 because that was sort of when we're thinking oh maybe we'll fold this because we're not engaging people 
and then we went there and we met a bunch of people from other campuses who we hadn't been able to get in contact with before who were really keen to start stuff um so i think um although maybe there's been this has been slowly happening i think there's been a real sort of um um rapid decline in sort of um how connected the student movement is between localities over the past two years uh, at least in my in my experience and i think that's come from a lack of any form of sort of national organization that can take on um this challenge um and any sort of form of national coordination um and then the second point i wanted to make was just um linking in with what um silver said which i thought was a, a really really good point um on school students i think something that strikes me um from when i've um gone to sort of camps or events um from com student comrades in in countries like italy or france um that people start organizing and get involved in the student movement from a much younger age um they do it while they're still in secondary school or whatever um and although we're starting to see that now there is a lack of sort of connection between university and school students which i think is really damaging um and i think uh i think that's been one of the sort of um most restrictive things about the student movement in the uk is that you have three or four years people will sort of come in they come in in their first year then they have those three or four years but maybe some people don't get involved in stuff until maybe their last year um they come in they quickly get politicized or, or sort of learn how to organize and they get churned out um and i think sort of any real sort of organic um political education and organizational education has to occur over a much longer period um so i think really starting younger uh is something that would be an important task um for for the student movement to undertake but obviously there's so many considerations for that and i think that is an extremely difficult task to do um but i think just something um following up from silver to to think about more that's a really good point thank you very much matthew and uh, next up hamish um, yeah so um, I don't want to start an argument, but I, I strongly don't think we should call them riots. Um, because I think this goes back to Alex's point about discursive uh, tension as to how you frame a movement. And my problem is that when people hear a riot, what they hear is a pointless kind of orgy of disorganized chaos, which may well be what it was at points. And I agree with you that it was, it certainly felt like that at point is what made it so exhilarating. But I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't start using the language of riots um, because I don't think that's what it was. I think it, it had a very clear purpose. It had a, a very unifying kind of cause. Anyway, I don't want to make too much of a big point of that, but I just, that, that was the only thing Poppy you said that I, everything else I thought you said was great. Um, the, I also just wanted to point out an obvious thing, which is when we keep talking about geographical divergence, that's partly because there is geographical divergence, right? Scottish students still don't pay fees. One of the most politicizing things that has galvanized Scottish, not just students, but society since then is the arguments around independence. Um, so some of those links that felt organic in 2010 are harder now for reasons that are material and kind of symbolic and that's tricky but it was amazing i mean i i still remember how many buses went down from edinburgh alone to london i mean it was an astonishing feeling right that was that um it it felt like you were touching the sky you know you 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 felt empowered in a way that i i think most people on those buses will never forget the other thing uh, just very quickly, and this I guess is where, so I was I was a member of the Edinburgh University Anarchist Society, which, which believe it or not, in the run up to that occupation was the largest political grouping on campus, in the sense that it had more people affiliated to it than the Labour Club. Um, and that's why the occupation, like many of them, was, was horizontal, right, for better or for worse, and we can obviously argue about that. Um, but I, I, I guess there's part of me, and this is maybe not very useful, that still thinks, yeah, when you watch Nakafka shoot itself like a cow in the foot, whatever the metaphor you use was, it's very good. 
isn't that the fate of all, you know, all institutions either ossify into one where you become careerist or they become boring and irrelevant? And especially institutions in a context where what your defining feature is youth, right? How stupid and weird would it be if you've got in a load a bunch of old fogies to come and tell you every generation of students, this is how we did it 20 years ago, um, which, you know, we had a bit of and we hated it. And so there's that necessity of each generation actually, to a certain degree, not knowing what was done before, so they can go through the experience themselves of being radicalized by the experience of discovery. The final thing I'll say um, um, is, is when Dante says we live in a very depoliticized campus, so did we, mate. You've got to remember that this was like, you know, we were living in the sort of Blairite a glow of a sort of like you know students who had been apathetic for generations like the, the, when 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 this movement exploded around the time of the fees debate people were stunned and we were kind of stunned as well so also worth noting that the same was said about 1968 in Paris right so don't never be never be lulled by a situation of a depoliticized campus because all it takes is, is, is something unpredictable and then things get a lot more interesting. Thank you very much, Hamish. Uh, and then we've got a new contributor, Maria. Go ahead. Um, I'm trying to switch on my camera. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria. I'm a lecturer at the University of Liverpool. And I also happen to study social movements in a and student movements mostly in a different context, which is Venezuela. And I remember when I was doing that, you know, at the new Bolivarian University, which was set by Hugo Chavez, and it was so radical and so fantastic. And, and there was a there was very interesting tension that you know this conversation reminds me of, I just wanted to raise it up, which was between the formal radicals, you know, who were out of power before Chavez came to power and then became the policy makers when he came to power. And out of a sudden they developed a completely new university. And then they expected that their own students are gonna be radicals on that university. But there was a, a kind of unwritten condition. They can't be radical against them. You know, like, so you can't be radical against the radicals from the previous generation. And, and so there is something about this that I, that I think is happening at present. And I, and I was, I think, most struck by it in the Goldsmiths boycott, you know, in which you're having already a, a generation that's kind of coming to into permanent positions. You know, they have their own, um, you know, issues of security, issues of how much they have already given to the struggle. They also want a normal life. They want to have kids. They want to have a mortgage, you know, they. They want to be all that, um, and, and there is there seems to be like a disconnect, right, between how many and how much you know you can be in a new generation that's not already preempted by what they think is radical and what they think is not. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's kind of quite interesting that it's like here, from what I see, it's mostly students, you know, in in some description or another, and and I'm wondering where is the place for a dialogue between these two generations where there might be some opposition and there might be some contestation, but there might be a new truth that's that's reached. Because otherwise we, we exist in parallel universes where you can't criticize anybody from our generation because you know we were the radicals maybe back then or something like this. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's here, I see Dante writing this, but, but like it would be nice if we were half half at least. You know, in terms of numbers, yeah. Um, and then, and then that's something that, like, when you were speaking about the 2010 protest, like one of the, one of the promises, in a way, that uh, Joe Grady came to power with in the UCU was that she was an activist in 2010. So even her, you know, her photos, her self-presentation, she she kind of drew a whole legitimacy from the minor strike where her grandparents, whatever, were you know, into the student movement where she was an activist into the nowadays reality. And out of a sudden, we're seeing her captured within a bureaucratic structure where she can't even support the Goldsmiths boycott. 
but we have to understand her because she was a radical, you know. And, and then and then there's all these kind of interesting tensions between generations. And I think it's a great thing that you have started this, but it would be nice to actually expand it and to be a bit more daring to call these people in and call them out, call us out. So you know, I'm not kind of absolving myself, even if like Sophia, I was from a different country in that moment, but I would like to be called out from the people that were around me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maria. Yeah, that's an excellent claim. Um, that's us at eight o'clock just now. So I now have a question for all of you. Um, we didn't actually get going until about 10 past seven. So would you like to extend the event on for 10 more minutes and have uh, maybe another question or two? I'm seeing a lot of nodding. Cool. Um, so does anyone want to jump in or shall I crack open one of the questions I had prepared? Honestly, I feel like the stuff that we've been talking about has been a lot more engaging. Sophia, Sophia, please go ahead. Yeah, may maybe I'm just going to try to say something to what Maria said. Um, yeah, I don't know what the technique, you know, and where, where, where we're going to do this work. Okay, like, like, who is exactly doing this work of kind of like shifting between the two. So, the the substance solidarity network is this group here which has some more um staff who are not here for for some reason tonight um but then we have all these people i mean it's a similar thing i mean when alex was saying that there were all these students who were supporting the thing but they were not participating uh, we have some groups like that in staff who are going, ah, ah, oh, oh, Sophia, the amazing stuff that you do, but they sort of never come to it, or they, some of them came last year when we had the launch uh, in, in ECA, and they came and they were like in the periphery, and we just didn't manage to activate them somehow. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is a case of me, because I'm speaking a lot, all of the students, the students came, I can't remember if it was Kate who came in an EIS meeting, you know, different students have come at that day, I can't remember, different people have come to like staff meetings. And we try to keep the balance of tutors and students. So I'm trying to not have students of ECA speaking to ECA tutors and kind of things like that. Uh, and I don't know if anyone has any ideas, or if, if Maria, wh where, how to do this work and, and whose job is that? Um, because I have tried, we have tried, and maybe oh, Isabel, I, maybe. It was definitely say. not a critique towards you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not a critique, no, it's just that, you know, like, um, yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, like, where should we do it? Um, I mean, I, like, just the thoughts, you know, my, my thinking is this is a UK white thing to be done first. It's not, I mean, it, it can be something that happens in Edinburgh, but you know, it might be hosted by Edinburgh, but it has to be uh, mm. something that captures this whole last 10 years of university struggles that you've kind of tried to draw on. And, and it might start small and it might go big. I don't know, like, I mean, it, it can be something or it might be one off event that that some people are invited that that are speaking about this. The person that comes to mind, you know, as an, as an obvious guest for something like this is having a, an event, I think, tonight with Kerry Milburn, who wrote The Generation Left. And yeah. probably some people in this audience would, would kind of recognize themselves maybe under that generation that has been studied as this kind of Corbyn generation and so forth. But it's interesting when it comes to union work and when it comes to the work within universities where many of these people find themselves in because of the massification of higher education, but with increasing debt and less and less security for the future. Um, you know, somehow the whole generation is outsourced to yeah, their electorate for the Labour Party. But how about when they become tutors on our universities and they're precarious and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I'm kind of trying to look locate it obviously like i mean look we can do something like this within the uc rank and file it doesn't have to be 
you know, it can be just an initi initiative that we take being between, you know, this meeting and other meetings like this. But I think it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be like a core of group that it, it's just opening a dialogue and seeing where it goes. That's that's my sense about it. Thank you both very much. Um, I then saw Isabel mm -hmm. and then Dante, is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I lowered my hand afterwards, or I, I thought I had, because um, Maria actually made the point that I, I think it cannot be some, uh, it has to be a national, um, we we would have to find uh, comrade organizations and, uh, and networks between staff and students and, and build that movement. And so, so far, I think We've been holding on. Uh, it's been like, yes, we, we do what we can in the period that we're in, but um, I think that's the next step because if there, if there isn't that uh, dynamic coming from linking with other people in the country, then, um, well, the, yeah, we, we're, not, we're not going, it, it's not meaningful to have this dialogue just at uh, Edinburgh level between, between staff and student on, on that gap that you're talking about, Maria. Um, I think that that's very right. But I don't see the UCU as being the platform for doing it. Thank you very much, Isabel. Sorry for, I, I wasn't sure, I'm never sure how to read the, the hand signals properly. Uh, Dante is next. Yeah, I'll be quick. I just kind of reflecting on what Maria and Isabel have said which is one of the difficult things we've always had in the small existence of the SSSN, sorry, maybe that was too many S's, um, is how we relate to the UCU and the union structure, which is we want to be more antagonistic and aggressive than the union system and whatever, however that gets bound up. But we're, in some sense, we're also kind of seen, are we just kind of like lackeys to the union and we're there to kind of like do more grassrootsy organizing amongst the students for the union when you know we want to kind of reserve the political ability to not be politically subsumed into the union apparatus and the demands you know the very specific demands they can make so we have to, then it's difficult to where is this space for dialogue because we either slip back into student land which will die in four years because a new generation of students come in or we enter into the union system and then we immediately just get subsumed into whatever that means so it's like how do we carve out the space which is within and in and against all of these things at once which is why the SSSN is the in most interesting thing, I think, but I don't know. Thank you very much, Dante. If, if I may add my own two cents, um, I agree. I think this is one of the big tensions we run up again. As, as Sophia mentioned, um, I've been in some of the union meetings and it's, there's always kind of a, a tightrope to walk between trying to be adversarial and, and push a point and then also trying to choose the right battles and, and be political about it and not, not come in as some undergraduate and then mouth off a lot about what seems very obvious from a new perspective but might actually be very well addressed for people who have been here for quite a while um and I, I think one of the things to pick up on is what you were saying about working across and through different institutions and not through one institutional body um but I guess the the question there is how to have that sort of unified Target like Alex, how you were talking about earlier, Alex, with um the 2010 2011 movement. One of the strengths is having that that singular focus and that that unity of of um action. How to have that level of of unity and connectedness um in in our, what we're targeting um while still not grounding yourself only in the union struggle or only in one thing or another. I do hope that the SSSN is exactly what that can be because we try to network between existing things but then um Sophia as you bring up the right the correct the, you bring up really well the, the problem of, of labor and how that then um there's then work that needs to be done to actually make this happen and how and where we find that time is almost as big a, a puzzle as anything else does anyone else want to speak on any of that Maria go ahead so I go well, like Sophia and I have been members of a few initiatives in the last couple of years that have been kind of trying to do what you're saying now, you know, like to to be 
within the union in the sense that we are union members we believe in the union we vote when we have to we go to the strikes when we have to but also we are trying to politicize the conversation because what the union has been doing for the last many years is to just have a profoundly bureaucratic unpleasant protocol that is actually repealing to members that's not you know in any way politic like connecting beyond like very specific demands and so so i think you know like that's and and we have been organizing some events around that and some initiatives so there is a there is a kind of small group and there is a bigger group a smaller group that's been activating about you know mental health issues in academia and and the union and then there has been the, the new i mean something like faction you see commons but it is more like they call it constellation which is trying not to just be another faction that is being elected but is trying to open more space and turf and i mean there would be some usual suspects that you would some of you remember from the 2010 campaigns and so forth you know plan c but but there would be also new faces and a lot of people like myself who weren't in the uk back then and so i think that can be a space where something like this can be opened and a few people can be engaged in helping to actually you know facilitate it and make it at least make the first step for for something like this to happen without losing the edge and the the kind of brand even if you want of the sssn <laughs> but also trying to actually strike the kind of difficult chord between you know the kind of union level organizing and and the students organizing that sometimes might actually find themselves in conflict and that can be productive if we know how to work through it yeah? so maybe sophia and i can bring this message back to <laughs> to where we where we have our own uh, connection and see see where it goes as well and be in touch Fantastic. Thank you very much. That is us at that extra 10 minutes. Uh, Dante had one last question from Matthew. Would everyone want us to go through that question? That question was, how has the rent strike group related to the unions and UCU so far? Um, or should we wrap up now? I don't have any strong feelings either way. Yeah. I'm seeing everyone that's fairly known to us, so we'll go for it. Last One last question. Matthew, if you would like. Yeah. Um... So I, I think this is quite an interesting question in terms of there's been, um, you know, relations and, and cooperation in terms of um, rent strike groups quite like sort of autonomously and of, the, of their own accord, um, adding demands around uh, no staff redundancies of, um, of demanding that sort of any money that gets spent on uh, their demands uh, or that their victory uh, doesn't come from, you know, staff redundancies or decreases in staff pay and stuff like this. And obviously, there's been sort of um, sort of conversations between rent strike groups and, and local UCU branches and statements of solidarity and stuff. Um, I think in terms of actual sort of um, sort of real relationship and cooperation, there's been very little. Um, and I think. Um, Part of that comes from on a national level, organizing with UCU um, seems maybe like a, a not a very wise thing to do um, in terms of national bureaucracies. Um, and on a local level, um, that's a lot harder because there's often a disconnect between, um, I think the people doing th these local rent strike organizing, which is at the moment mostly freshers in halls, um, rather than sort of your traditional older cadre of student organizers. Um, and um, sort of UCU branch members who who maybe um, don't want to get too involved in this stuff, um, who can't relate as easily to these these people, um, and at least from my experience at UCL, we always had passive support from the UCU branch, um, and we've quite a, an SWP dominated UCU branch, um, but as soon as sort of shit hit the fan they were always sort of ready to, to throw us um throw us into the sort of throw us into the fire and 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 sort of push everything onto onto the student organizers um so i think um the question of union cooperation is, is sort of a difficult one um 
And I think something that I would like to see to sort of end this on um, in the future and that I sort of have pushed for is the use of rent strike tactics, not just for sort of student housing issues, but as more generally as a sort of form of leverage uh, and a tactic that can be used, for instance, in, in solidarity with striking workers on campus, be they sort of academic staff or academic related staff or auxiliary staff. Um, and sort of another thing that can add leverage onto existing worker struggle uh, and creating those sort of relationships organically and through, through uh, actions of solidarity rather than just, you know, words of solidarity. Um, yeah, I think I'll finish with that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matthew. And what an excellent thing to finish with. And thank you very much to ev thank you very much to everyone. Um, it's been fantastic and thriving conversation. Um, way more than I expected, and I'm I'm really excited that it's done as it did. Unfortunately, that's probably all we can squeeze out of this uh, rather large hour. Um, but um, with the success of this, and uh, hopefully with some even more participants, uh, hopefully we'll be back in about a month's time or so for a follow-up to this. Um, we'd like to have something else. Um, and um, if you do go and talk to anyone else about this, we'll be putting this on YouTube. It'll be available to watch as soon as we can get it edited. If anyone who's spoken today doesn't want to be on that or has said anything that they'd rather doesn't go on publicly on the internet, please message us. Um, or even if you're just unsure, you can message us to get a, a look at the footage before we put it up. Um, but if there's no other points, I think we will end there. Thank you very much and um, hope to see you all soon. Oh, to be able to Just I want to say that um, if we, we are going to continue that or maybe have some other sessions, maybe the people who were tonight here, if they have any ideas about specific things that we can discuss, maybe they can suggest or, or people to bring that they know uh, into something. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, you can also get in contact with us through the Staff Student Solidarity Network Facebook page if you need. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Hey, good night. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.